Welcome to Stories of Freedom, a podcast about discovering and embracing who you are in Christ. On each episode, you'll hear from people who have overcome obstacles, gained freedom, and found abundant life. Then we'll look back at each interview through a biblical lens and figure out what could apply to your life and your story because knowing your identity changes everything. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to share these stories and biblical principles. Every believer needs to know who they are in Christ, how to fight the battle for the mind, and how to walk by faith in repentance. Stories of Freedom is a production of Freedom in Christ Ministries. I'm Dan Stute, President of Freedom in Christ USA. And I'm Abby Batson, your co-host. Today, our guest on the show is Daryl Fitzgerald. Daryl is a husband, father, and proud new grandfather. He's worked as a pastor, life coach, and speaker. He and his wife, Stephanie, currently do discipleship training around the country. As a kid growing up in a small town in Virginia, Daryl experienced racism on a daily basis. He developed an inferiority complex, believing that he was worthless and that being white was better than being black. This led him to try to find security and significance in things like girls, partying, and basketball. Daryl grew up going to church regularly, but he didn't give his life to Christ until college. However, simply becoming a Christian didn't erase the pain he'd experienced. A lot of the things that I brought into Christianity, I never really dealt with. So when I became a child of God, I still had a lot of difficulties growing up in a small town that I experienced racism to the fullest extent. You know, I thought, quote unquote, giving my life to Jesus was going to solve all of that. It did not solve all of that. Daryl finished college, got married, and started working at a church. But he and Stephanie started having problems in their marriage that they couldn't fix until they learned about their identity in Christ and how to truly repent and forgive. Embracing these truths changed Daryl's life and his marriage and gave him a passion for helping others experience their own freedom in Christ. He writes about it alongside Stephanie in their first book, From Slavery to Freedom, which came out earlier this month. Here's our conversation with Daryl Fitzgerald. Well, hey, Daryl. Welcome. It is good to see you, and uh, we're so grateful that you are willing to share some of your story on this new podcast, Stories of Freedom. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Abby, thank you, guys. Yeah, well, it's a joy, and we do want to talk about your new book, From Slavery to Freedom. And so, if you will, just to kind of let the listeners get to know you a little bit, tell us a bit about your growing up years. What were a few of those significant things that happened in your childhood? Man, I I grew up in a really small town in Virginia. Um, Most of you probably have not heard of the small town. It's called Ridgeway, R-I-D-G-E-W-A-Y, Ridgeway, Virginia. It's where the Martinsville Raceway is. But I was disconnected from that world in racing. You know, I was more connected to the African American experience, not to the millions of dollars that came through that town through the raceway. And uh, I grew up probably 200 miles from where the first slaves were introduced into this country. The first 20 slaves were introduced into Jamestown, Virginia. I was 200 miles east of that. And so growing up in that small town, we get the residual effects of what that is because, you know, Agriculture was really one of the main resources that England wanted back into uh, London when they had um, delivered the first slaves into the country. And so my, my grandfather grew up on one of the farms that farmed tobacco back into England. And uh, I grew up playing in those tobacco fields. I grew up in those tobacco fields with the big worms, the, the really big fat worms where you just... You, as a kid, you just didn't, you don't know what you're doing, but you just want to have some fun. You're just playing. So I grew up in, in that type of environment where, where racism, where slavery, where um, social injustice was first started in this country. And so that's the backdrop that I want to give to you so that you'll know how I grew up in, in a small town. And, and I, I, 
I was born in 1967. So from 67 to 77, you know, 10 years, you know, that was a really crucial time because that was the really ending of the civil rights movement. The, the free love movement started then. And not only that, but, you know, we had a lot of people uh, rebelling in that age, in that time. The Vietnam War had just went off and <laughs> there was a lot going on in that, in that time. And so, you know, segregation was huge. Desegregation was trying its best to be something that was really brought up in, in our neighborhood. And so while I hear I come, I'm a little kid in the middle of desegregation when the schools were trying to des desegregate in the country. And so growing up in that atmosphere, you can imagine all the things that were happening in that time. Man, it was a perfect storm. So racism was at an all time high in the 60s and 70s. And people just did not know how to get together and, and love one another. Just, you know, it's, it's kind of reflective of today. You still don't know how to do that and have a good conversation about how to really fight this battle of racism and elitism and sexism. We're in some dark, dark times and we have to have some answers to really, as the body of Christ, address these issues. So that's the background. That's the backdrop of how I grew up. And so I got some stories to tell you. I know you'll ask me some of those questions, but I have some stories of my own, that I, my own experiences that um, I went through as a kid in a really dark racist county town that I grew up in. Mm. Yeah, Daryl, just to piggyback off that, one of those stories that we would love to hear is in your book as well. Um, and it's a story when you were in third grade um, at school and you talk about just the impact it had on you and what it made you believe about yourself. So will you share that story with us and then um, what it made you believe about yourself afterward? Yeah, I, I, for some odd reason, as a kid, uh, seven, eight, nine years old, I think in the African-American community, you grow with this sixth sense that you, you know where you're welcomed and you know where you're not welcomed. And when you know where you're welcomed, you can relax a little bit. There's less anxiety, there's less fear, and there's less trying to pretend that you're somebody that you're not. So uh, just my first really experience with racism, I always knew something was different about being black and white, but I never understood what it was in, in the town that I grew up in. So in the third grade, you know, right, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid in school. I'm, I don't know anything. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. And one of the things that the teacher allowed us to do every day was to be, the, if you were in first in line, to be uh, the leader of the group to the lunchroom. So I desperately tried to always be first in line, but I never could make it. Well, would, lo and behold, <laughs> I made it on this day. I'm the first one in line, in which I'm so proud that I made it to the front of the line. I don't know, do it myself. I'm excited about it. And I look up at the teacher and I look, her, look at her face and there is this scowl on her face. Now, remember, I'm still growing up in this, this segregation, racism, you know, social injustice age. So there's this scowl on her face and she wouldn't even make eye contact with me. Now, I was wanting to make eye contact with her just to make her proud that I made it to the front of the line for the first time ever. But she looked right over my head and she gave this scowl like I should not have been there. And... I wondered at that time, man, did I do something wrong? Why is she not treating me like the rest of the kids when they reached the front of the line? She gave them pats on the head and say, good job. You know, I'm glad you made it to the front. But when, she, when it came to me, I was treated totally different. So she was ready to, to take the kids to the lunchroom. So she made sure all the kids were lined up. That's, that was a time where you had to line up before you, had to do, you could do anything. So we lined up, right? So... As we lined up, she turned and walked towards the steps toward the lunchroom. And I'm just excited about being in still. And even though I'm wondering what, what did I do wrong, I'm still excited. And as I'm walking to the lunchroom, walking down the flight of stairs, she all of a sudden she stops. And when she stops, she kicks me with the back of her heel. And at this moment, I knew as a third grader, I knew what she was trying to do. 
it was as if she was saying, it's not okay for you to lead these kids, especially the white students down to the lunchroom because you should be at the back, not at the front. I was totally humiliated. I was totally embarrassed. I felt like the second class citizen that she was wanting me to feel like. I felt that and I felt the intense fear. I felt intense insignificance. I felt intense insecurity from that. That was my first experience from a grown adult feeling those type of feelings from doing something that I thought was a good thing. It turned out in her mind that it was not such a good thing. And from that point on, man, that was the introduction to me being in the third grade to experiencing my first bout with racism. And that was really impactful on me as a kid. And now I'm second guessing everything that I do from that point. So I went home and told my parents about it. But what are they going to do? You know, they're, they're looked upon as second class citizens as well. So what do you do about that? So I grew up with that type of insecurity, you know, and it started in the third grade. Mm-hmm. Did you ever try and get to the front of the line again? I did not. I did not. I knew that was a place where I was not supposed to be. I felt like there was a place where if I got there in the front of the line again, that I would cause trouble. And so I, 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 I chose not to do that again. Let that sit for a second. A third grade kid who's trying to learn about life, who's trying to experience life, your first experience with your teacher who's supposed to teach you the good and the bad of life. She teaches you that your your race is inferior to her race. It was really, really impactful as a kid. So I can only imagine what kids feel like when they experience racism as teenagers, but not much more or less than a third grader. And this is something that I that I believe the body of Christ. Now, I'm not saying I'm not sharing this story to the body of Christ to make them feel like I'm a victim or to make them feel sad for me or to make them feel like, man, that's that's horrible, even though it's a horrible story. But we have to start addressing these issues in this country from a godly perspective in order for us to heal from this. This is a healing that has to take place. And the only place that I believe that healing is going to take place is in the body of Christ, but we have to be open and honest with each other to be able to share these stories. I don't share this with you because you're white men and women. I share this with you because you are a child of God who represents the King of Kings and and the Lord of Lords so that you can understand what it feels like as a African-American growing up in a society based on the color of your skin that you're not welcomed in this country. That's the reality that we must face and look at and say, okay, man, um, is this a real thing for African-Americans? It is a real thing, but we are still facing in this country those types of things that we got to address. And hopefully this book will help bring some healing to some of the people that are trying to address this issue. Yeah, I've got two questions for you to follow up on that, and I'm glad you mentioned that because you talked about telling your parents— Right. But what were they supposed to do? Because they had also, you know, been designated by others as second class citizens. So they didn't feel like they had a voice uh, to advocate for you or to correct the situation. What did that make you believe about yourself or about God in in those moments as an eight year old? Do you remember what you believed about yourself as a result of that incident? Yeah. um, One of the first thoughts that I had that came across my mind was that being white is better than being black. And that I'm a marked man and life is going to be difficult for me. And this is the third grade this happened. I'm a marked man because of the color of my skin. So that brought a insecurity in me that really was was hard to to shake it also made me feel like my my sense of intelligence was in question you know what what makes you think that you are smart enough to lead someone else of a different race so it attacks so many different things it, it attacks so many things in in me as a kid you know why do you feel that you can 
be something other than what you are, which is a second class citizen. So those things were implanted at a very young age. And so I grew up with that mentality. I felt like I was not a very smart guy, that I didn't have what it took to lead anybody. And and those types of incidents and those types of experiences didn't help. And I'm only telling you one experience. (laughs) I'm telling you all of the experiences that I grew up in. I'm only just sharing this one because that's what you asked. You asked me to share this this particular story. And, uh, you know, I go into some other stories in the book, but, you know, this is the one that really started it for me. Yeah, but that's that actually leads into the other question that came to mind for me, which is uh, actually a quote from John Eldridge in his book, Waking the Dead. And he said that uh, Satan will always try and get people to do to you what he has been doing to you your whole life, right? Satan will always try and get people to do to you what he has been doing to you your whole life. So you just mentioned this pattern or this message to you was then repeated more as a child through your teen years and, and even probably into young adulthood. Yeah, absolutely. The Bible calls him the father of lies. The power of Satan lies within the lies that he tells us. And if we believe those lies, what happens to us is he gains control over our lives to make us believe what he thinks of us rather than what God thinks of us. When God looks at me, according to the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 26, God created all man out of one man. He created us all. But I didn't know that as a kid. My, my background was God must not love me because he created me black. God must not, he, he must think that I am something less than because, you know, look at all the white kids that are getting, that are prospering. Look at the African-American community of where I grew up in. Look, look at what's happened to us. Poor, no education. You, know, you have to fight for everything you're looking for. And so that was the type of dilemma that I was growing up in. God must not like me. And all the pictures that I saw about that looked like Jesus were white. Blonde, I mean, blue eyes, long hair, didn't look like me. And so I grew up believing that Jesus was this westernized guy that was for white people and not for black people. That's the, the mentality that I grew up in. You know, even though we knew that there was something special about Jesus, we also knew that there was something detrimental about Jesus for us as well because of the color of our skin. He doesn't, he's not for me, he's against me. And that's totally opposite of what the Bible talks about. God is for us, he's not against us. You know, he, he never leaves us nor forsakes us, he is for us. I, I didn't know this stuff growing up, but now I know it. And I, I know there are thousands and thousands of kids and students and people, black, white, brown, yellow, red, purple, it doesn't make any difference. All God's children need to know the truth of who they are in him. And if they don't know the truth of who they are in him, what's going to inevitably happen is Satan will paint a picture and that picture will be negative and that picture will, will not be the truth and that picture will have him to gain control over their lives if, if they don't understand what Jesus did for them, who Jesus is for them and that type of thing. So we have to tell the truth because the truth sets people free. Mm. Daryl, um, you just mentioned God, and you did grow up in the church, um, but it wasn't actually until college that you came to Christ. So you go on to Liberty University, you get a scholarship for basketball. And however, that first year, everything didn't quite go as you planned. No, it didn't. Yeah. Can you just tell us about that <laughs> freshman year? Yeah. Um, the backdrop of that is I never wanted to be stuck in my neighborhood as a kid because I did not like what I was feeling as far as racism is concerned. I didn't like the oppressive spirit that was there. I couldn't have put it into words that it was oppressive and it was really satanic. But, you know, I just knew I wanted out. So I was pretty good at at sports. Anything I put my hand to playing sports-wise, I was good at. And my stepfather had the foreknowledge to say, okay, I don't have the the finances to get him out of the, the situation that we're in. So he came to me at a young age and said, I don't have money. 
I can't get you out of here, but you're going to have to do something that's going to help you to be able to succeed and to be able to make it in this world. And he started me off putting me in sports at a very young age. I played baseball. I played soccer. I played, I didn't play football because I was smart enough. I don't want to get broken. <laughs> I played basketball, I, I, anything but football I played. But the thing that I was really good at was playing basketball. And in the 10th grade, he asked me a, a really pivotal question. He said, okay, now I see that you're not going to get the chances here at the place that I was going to play high school basketball, would you like to be transferred to a private school to play basketball? Well, yeah, I did. I played for three years and that's where I got my scholarship offer from Liberty University. After playing three years, I was able to secure that, that scholarship. First African-American to, to graduate from this private school, the first one ever. And, um, Again, that's the background of where, where I grew up. Now, now I've learned that everybody in that area isn't racist, but everybody in that area did deal with racism. So, and some people wanted to really help those who were underprivileged to be able to get out. And so that's what I believe God had me on that road to get me out of the area that I was in. And so when I got to Liberty University, I thought I was moving away from my past, but my past caught up with me um, because it's so much in, I can't tell right now, but it's in the book, you're going to buy it. It's so much I can't tell, but in the book, I explain how I got to Liberty University and the first semester I get there, a whole new world opens up to me. You know, you, you have people from all over the country in this little small college. And we had about 6,000 people at the school. And I, I began to see different cultures and different races of, of people that are there. And so it wasn't just black and white. It was everything. It was Latino. It was Laotian. It was a huge amount of people that were there from different parts of the country. So I get to the school. Now, I'm one of the smallest guys on campus playing basketball. And so, but I'm, I'm having to prove myself. I want to prove myself to be successful. Now, remember, I, I had to fight for that all my life. So I'm, I'm trying to prove who I am. And so I dig myself into sports. I dig myself into proving to the coach that I am I'm the guy. You're not going to be disappointed that you picked me. But all, all of a sudden, all of my past catches up with me. And I am sexually active on campus, on a Christian campus. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be sexually active on a campus that's quote unquote based on in, in the Christian faith, but I didn't care anymore. You know, I'm trying to prove who I am. And so my, my life was basketball. And so I'm not, I'm not thinking about God. I'm thinking about who I am and what I, what I can do to get out of my situation. And so two months into me being on campus, I did anything I wanted to do because I didn't recognize being on the campus like that you become the big man on campus because you're a quote unquote sports star. And because you are a star, you can pretty much get away with anything you want to. At least I thought that anyway. So two months into that, you know, I'm on campus and they catch me in the middle of sexual activity. <laughs> so I'm on campus, right? And so they catch me. And now I'm being sit in front of the Dean's office. I have about 12 people that I'm sitting in front of. And those 12 people, they're, they're grilling me. What were you doing on the campus? And why were you doing this? And so on and so forth. You can imagine the question they were asking. And my RA tried to warn me, Daryl, you, you can't be doing what you're doing. You got to stop this. And so this is the thing that really got me. <laughs> like that was a dove, right? They told me I had to call my parents and tell them what had happened, why I'm being sent home and I'm losing my basketball scholarship. You have to call and tell them that. So I called my parents and my mom was totally devastated. My dad was like, son, pack your bags. So I packed my bags right now. My life is just over. So now I go back home. Now I'm in the mindset of, well, I messed up. I may as well do drugs 
do cocaine like the rest of the people in my community because, quote unquote, we're nobody anyway. We're not going anywhere anyway. So I might as well do the things that's going to make me happy. So I started doing cocaine. I started doing drugs. I started smoking weed. You know, so I, I started doing those things. And uh, this is the grace of God in my life. The school called me back at the top of December. And they said to me, we want to give you a second chance. We want to give you your scholarship back. And you can come back to school the next semester. I don't know why they did that, except but the grace of God. I don't know why they would call my home. And so when they called us and I told my parents about it, I learned a valuable lesson in that moment. I thought I learned a valuable lesson. That man, here's my valuable lesson. I must be pretty good at playing basketball. <laughs> Can you believe that? The pride and the arrogance that I had. I must be good that they call me back and they want to offer me my basketball scholarship back. I, I, I must be pretty good. And so they offered me the, the scholarship back. Now, here's, here's what happened. I get back on campus. I'm high-fiving everybody on campus. I'm back. You know, it was only a semester. I'm, I'm, I can come back and do my thing. And then I went to this chapel service. In this chapel service, I hear a guy by the name of Bailey Smith. He's an evangelist on campus. And he starts to preach in Matthew chapter 13. And I heard the gospel like I never heard it before in my life. And he starts to say, and I can remember today, he said, some of you have been going to church your whole life, and that was me. He said, some of you act like Christians, and that was me. You talk like Christians, and that was me. You look like a Christian, that was me. But on the inside, you don't have the seed of the Holy Spirit on the inside, just like the wheat and the tear, the parable of the wheat and the tear. And when he said that, the conviction of God fell on me like never before I had experienced. And that's when I gave my life to Christ. I had been going to church all my life, but I was not a Christian. I knew the religious things to do, but I was not a, a, a saint. I was not a child of God. I knew how to say amen. I knew how to raise my hands. I knew how to walk forward. I knew, I, I knew the Christianese work to do, but I didn't know Christ. And so when, when he gave me that invitation to come to, to know who Christ is, I basically ran down. I ran down the front and I gave my, my heart to Jesus on that day. And that, that was the beginning of my journey to starting to find the freedom that I needed in Christ. Thank you so much for sharing all that, Daryl. It's encouraging, yeah, to see God's faithfulness um, in your life there. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. Um, so you are you end up finishing your degree in psychology at Liberty University. You go on to form a Christian hip hop group and you start traveling around the country performing, which that's a whole nother story in, a, in and of itself. But you meet your wife, Stephanie, when you're traveling. Um, and so you date, you end up getting married. Um, we are fast forwarding a lot, but after a few years into marriage, you begin having some issues. Um, so on the outside, you're thriving, you're, you know, you're involved in church, but inwardly you're struggling. So will you just tell us about that time? Well, it's a lot of the things that I brought into Christianity, I never really dealt with. So when I, when I became a child of God, I still had a lot of difficulties growing up in a small town that I experienced racism to the fullest extent. And so instead of me dealing with those things and having to be able to function in a society that says, okay, now you got to deal with the pain of your life and how you grew up. You know, I thought, quote unquote, giving my life to Jesus was going to solve all of that. It did not solve all of that. You know, what, what Jesus did, he, he put me on the road to success when I gave my life to Christ, but he's going to hold me responsible to get the healing that I need when it comes to what I need to have as a child of God. And so I brought a lot of the pain that I experienced into my childhood. I brought that into my marriage with my, with my wife. And, you know, marriage, you know, I know Neil Anderson says this, Marriage does not solve the problems that you bring into your marriage. What marriage does, it brings them up. <laughs> and so 
my wife and I, we loved each other. We had a wonderful relationship. We've, we've, we've been married for 30 years this past April. We have a great relationship now, but we didn't have a great relationship in the beginning of our relationship with each other because we both brought issues into the relationship that we, we both brought bondages into the relationship that we didn't know how to handle. And those things that we didn't know how to handle, they kept showing up in our relationship with each other. And it was a buffering. It was a time of, it was a hard time for the both of us. And so one of the guys that I worked with in the inner city invited us to a Dr. Neil Anderson Freedom in Christ conference. And this is my, this was my first thought. And I remember I, t- I, didn't, I didn't know how to deal with my pain. This is my first thought. What can this white man tell me about my experience as an African-American? He can't tell me anything because he didn't know my story. But it was the total opposite. This guy, he's a farmer. <laughs> Not only he's a farmer, but he's, he's whiter than white. And I'm African-American. And I'm saying, like, hey, this man is telling me things about myself that there's no way he should know this stuff. Now, I know it was the Holy Spirit of God, but I also knew that he was talking about some of the experiences that I was having, but he never was in the town that I lived in with those experiences. So how can he know this stuff? So it intrigued me to the point where I was like, man, this guy has my attention and this guy know some things spiritually that I have no clue. I want to know who that guy is. So we stayed to the, for the conference for three days. And in, in those three days, man, he, he shared spiritual principles and spiritual freedom in a way that I never had heard it before. And so God used Dr. Anderson's conference in 1992 to help my wife resolve some of the emotional mental and spiritual problems that we both brought into our relationship that helped us to be able to be married 30 years later. And those things that were shared in that conference were the catalyst of me trying to understand how do I get involved in this ministry? Because I bought everything that I could buy from that conference. I read Big Devil with the Dragons, which was one of his first books. I bought that book I've listened, I promise you guys, I read that book probably 20 times within a span of eight months because I was trying to understand what was going on spiritually because I didn't understand the spiritual world that we lived in that manifests itself in, in a physical way. And so you reading that book that many times, it, it really intrigued me to understand, man, there is a spiritual world that I had no clue how to battle without the weapons that God has given us. And that spiritual world is where the real battle is. The battle is not with racism. The battle is with the spirit behind division of racism. And so learning how to fight that has been one of my number one goals in this country because, man, (laughs) fast forward to today, we're lost. Even in the church, we're lost. We don't know how to fight this battle because we look at it as a physical war. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. Yeah, and so in that conference, you learned some of how to fight that spiritual battle, uh, but especially how do you fight that within yourself? How do you take your thoughts captive? How do you submit to God and resist the devil? Uh, How do you walk by faith in obedience? Can you elaborate? What are a couple of the principles that you learned that were so impactful? Well, the first principle, and this is, I think this is foundational to every believer in Christ. The first principle is this, knowing who you are as a child of God, that's number one. And number two is knowing who God is as a loving father. Those are two, I believe, the most instrumental things you have to know in order for you to function in a society where you're not loved or you're not appreciated because everyone looks for significance and everyone looks for security. And God showed himself to you and I. He showed how significant we are by dying for us. He showed us how secure we are by saying, you don't have to pay for your sins. I'll pay for your sins for you. 
And those two principles are the best when it comes to understanding your identity. My identity as a black man doesn't come from my African-American heritage. My identity comes from knowing God as my father, knowing God as his son. Who I am in Christ is the foundation of my own life when it comes to understanding my my significance, my security, my belonging. I'm loved. If no one else loves me, I know one thing that God does. He, he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son. He died for my sins. He died for my mess ups. He died for my racist heart, you know, because I could be a Black Panther. <laughs> I could be a Malcolm X, you know, those types of things. However, I'm not that only because of the grace of God. I'm God's child who looks at other people through the eyes of Christ, not through the eyes of their experience. And that's really key for me. It helps me be able to, to keep bitterness and unforgiveness out of my heart because I know God forgave me for much. He can forgive people as well. It's just a beautiful thing. It's beautiful to know that my identity, my heritage is not in my African-American color. My heritage is in Christ. And I can express it through my African-American heritage. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. There's so much in the world that wants to define us, put us in a box, whether it's the color of our skin or even in our own minds, the, the, what we've just done or our behavior. Or, there's so many different things that seek to define us. But I know, you know for me, it's been so critical, too, to, to be defined first and foremost by that relationship we now have with the king of the universe. He's our dad. Listen, uh, listen, we, man, this, this blows me away every time I share it. I have the same DNA of the God who created the universe. I'm born of the King of Kings. I'm born of the Lord of Lords. If I live beneath my privileges as his child, that's my fault. It's my fault. I have the same DNA as the one who created the birds and the bees and the stars and the moon. I had the same DNA. He looks at me as his son. I don't have to look at myself through the eyes of the teacher who kicked me and said, you're beneath me. I can look at myself through the eyes of the creator of the universe who says, look at what I did for you. Oh, man, that's some good stuff. And so understanding that is beautiful. Yeah. And it has practical application in life because today you're a leader of people. Uh, both black and white and other ethnicities. And so how did knowing these truths about you help turn around that perspective that I can't lead because I'm black, right? How did knowing that practically apply to, no, God has made me to be a leader, an influencer of others? Yeah, um, I can't see myself through the eyes of other people without first looking at myself through the eyes of my creator. He endowed within myself gifts, talents, that he is going to hold me responsible for when I see him. And so if you have a problem with my skin color, that's your problem. It's not my problem. I am going to answer to the one who created me. And what he's going to do is ask me, the talents that I gave you, what did you do with those talents? Did you hide them away? Did you use them and invest them? What did you do with those things? So I have to constantly tell myself, I am going to answer to the one who created me. And that way, when I see someone who does not appreciate what I do, I don't allow them to tell me that they can dictate what my value is. I already know my value because of what my father's done for me, my heavenly father. It's a spiritual battle. Satan is always going to place racism in front of me. I know that without a doubt. There's going to be more stories. I hate to say it. There's going to be more stories that come out because as long as Satan can use people to perpetuate his lies about people, about racism, People are going to succumb to his beliefs and people are going to believe what he says and they're going to live it out. I can't stop that. My job is to tell the truth and the truth set people free. 
when it comes to what they believe, God wants to use me and say, hey, this is what you believe. You tell that story. You tell people who they are. You help people understand their value. You help people understand their significance. You help people understand who they are. They're valued and they're loved by the creator of this universe and nothing can stop that. Amen. And Daryl, that's exactly what you and Stephanie have done in your new book, From Slavery to Freedom. You were just talking about how that's what you can do is you can share your story. And that's what you've done in this book is you've shared your own story from spiritual bondage to spiritual freedom in Christ, um, which it's a phenomenal book. And I highly recommend everyone to go buy it. So as we wrap up, will you just tell us briefly, first, why did you and Stephanie decide to write this book? And then what do you hope readers will get out of it? I was not planning on writing this. My wife was not planning on writing this. I honestly believe that this is something that God wanted us to put pen and paper to because I'm not a writer. That's not my, my gifts, you know, but I believe that this is something that will help people. If it, even if it's one person, it will help people to understand that they're valued and they're loved by the creator of the universe. And to stop trying to get value and love from people because people can't give you what you're looking for that's only found in Christ. And that's why we want to write it is because we want people to understand, look beyond what you see and see what God sees in you and not what others see in you. Because others can change, but God's love, it's everlasting. It never changes. It will be consistent. He will love you from here to eternity, but you got to know what that is and practically understand how to get that love in your life as his child. Mm. And I'd, I'd love to just ask you one more question about the beginning of the book. You include this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. So I'm going to read the quote and then I'd love for you to just tell us why you chose to include that quote. So this is from Martin Luther King Jr. It says, God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men. God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race. It's power packed. God loves his children. He loves people. He created us all in his image and in his likeness. And he wants all of us to be free from the lies of the enemy that tries to constantly divide us. God is about family. He wants us all to be united with him as his family, as his sons and as his daughters. He created us all. I told you I, I, I was afraid. I, I didn't like myself as a black man. Oh, I love my African-American heritage right now. I love who I am because that's who God created me to be. And you should love your heritage. You should love your race. You should love your skin color. But you will only be able to love your skin color and who you are only when you see it through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Once you see yourself through his eyes, my God, you can see what you offer to this world and the world can't stop you. That's one of the reasons why I put that quote in there, because God loves all people, not just black people, white people. He loves everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Daryl, thank you so much for being with us today to share your story on this podcast, Stories of Freedom. We're so grateful for you and for Stephanie, and we pray that this book will speak into many lives. God bless you. Thank you. Racism, depression, anxiety, fear, addiction. These are heavy realities in our world today, and they're some of the topics that Daryl and Stephanie Fitzgerald address in their new book, From Slavery to Freedom. In the book, Daryl and Stephanie share their powerful story of overcoming pain, hardship, and brokenness. They also offer practical tools to help you experience real, lasting freedom in Christ. From Slavery to Freedom will empower you to embrace your identity, break free from old flesh patterns, and walk in freedom. It will also give you a fresh perspective on the existence of racism and how we can bring healing to our division. The book is currently on sale for only $14. And for you, we have a special gift. Use the code PODCAST at checkout to get an additional $2 off. 
So grab your copy of From Slavery to Freedom today by going to freedominchrist.com or click on the link in the show notes. And don't forget to use the code PODCAST to get your $2 off. Well, Dan, that was an incredible interview with Daryl. I'm really thankful that he shared his story with us and shared so honestly and vulnerably, um, especially that story he shared when he was in third grade and just the effect that that had on him, the lies that he believed, um, how he operated in this mindset of insecurity and insignificance. But one of the things that really stood out to me is as he talked about racism, he really brought it back to the fact that racism is a spiritual issue and that we, the way we battle it, the way we fight racism is it's a spiritual battle that it's not just a us versus them. There's obviously practical things. He mentions in his book about like laws and things that helped bring equality to African-Americans. So he's not saying those things aren't important, but he's saying ultimately it's our hearts and it's a spiritual battle. And that just really stood out to me just because I haven't heard that a lot in the church of just bringing it back to Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, and we battle not against flesh and blood. Um, I think that was really encouraging for me to be reminded of, and even as believers, knowing how to pray and how to engage with these topics that are, as he said, not going away anytime soon. Yeah, too often we see it from a purely worldly perspective, but he did a great job of reminding us of the spiritual reality uh, that lies behind all of this. We talked about it a little bit, but it really reminded me of the Second Corinthians 5 passage uh, where Paul says, the love of Christ controls or compels us to share the gospel, essentially. And he says in verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Right? If we're evaluating people primarily by the color of their skin, then we are in the wrong. Right? We are making a mistake according to the gospel because he says if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You mentioned 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Not everybody is a believer. and We can't expect them to see the spiritual battle for what it is. We can't expect them to have the Spirit of God within them because they don't. And I don't say that from a point of judgmental condemnation, but really compassion. I would, I would love that. And that's Paul's point in this passage is we're compelled by the love of Christ to share this good news that we can have reconciliation because once we're in Christ, he says, the old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, right? That forgiveness piece that Daryl talked about, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, right? So brothers and sisters listening, we are ambassadors. We do have this message and this ministry of reconciliation, but it starts where Paul says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It's only once we're reconciled to God that then we can experience being reconciled to one another. That's where it begins spiritually. Yeah. I think the last thing I would say too is just a powerful quote that um, Daryl has in his book and he also said was how his physical heritage as an African-American does not primarily define who he is, but it's his spiritual heritage as a child of God. And um, that just makes me think of Galatians 3, which just talks about there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And um, for as many have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And so that idea that What's first and foremost, as Christians, we are children of God and our our heritage, whether black, white, American, British, fill in the blank, like that's secondary. 
Yeah, and he said he had been ashamed of his skin color, or he learned to be ashamed. But now he's proud of his African-American heritage. But again, because his primary identity is in Christ, and then secondarily, trusting God's sovereignty that he was born into the family that God wanted him born into, and even in the town, to experience what he wanted to. And so we can trust God with however he has created us. Well, Abby, thank you so much for your work to make these podcasts possible. I appreciate you, and we pray that this uh, reaches many ears and they're encouraged in their walk with God. So thanks for what you do, Abby. Appreciate you. Thank you, Dan. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Stories of Freedom. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And help us get the word out by sharing Stories of Freedom with your family and friends. To learn more about freedom in Christ, visit FICM.org or follow us on social media by searching Freedom in Christ USA. The links are in the show notes.